Hello, Canada. Welcome back to another One Soccer Hangout. Today on the program, it is the new boss of Pacific FC, Pa Madhu Ka, as well as Kurt Larson and Oliver Platt. And as always on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, my name is Adam Jenkins. Great to have everyone along with us. Coach, great to have you here. Great to see you. It's going to be a fantastic hour where CPL fans can get to learn a little bit more about you and just hang out for a bit because what else is there to do right now in quarantine? How are things going? No, thank you for having me. Obviously, yeah. All of us would have liked to be on the pitch, giving session, some be commentating, but at this moment we can't because of the COVID-19. It is what it is, but yeah, at least we get to see each other via Zoom call. So looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Ollie, at this point, I'm only doing this just because I'm I'm worried about you because the answers <laughs> seem to be the same in melancholy every day. But Mr. Platt, how are you holding up? Yeah, so I asked Adam before we started here not to ask me that question because I just have absolutely nothing to say. I think we're on what, week four now, and uh, yeah, there there is no update in my life, so we, we can move on to, to the more important topics. It's important to check in on your friends and co-workers, though. Kurt, how are things in the Larson compound? Uh, good. Uh, actually, last night I spent uh, an hour baking chocolate chip cookies. Uh, I should have brought some over there just, from, uh, just, just to prove I, I can actually... Uh, cook pretty well but uh it's a recipe that's been in the family for a long time so uh maybe i'll i'll, uh, I'll send you guys some that would be fantastic well that'll be our next program on one soccer cooking with kurt i think it'll be a smash hit. yes sure <laughs> okay guys we've been forced to make uh, a couple last minute changes to our rundown nothing too major but there was some news that came out today from the professional football association of canada on their website pfccan.ca so Kurt, if you want to just fill us in on what you know and what you've heard from today's news. Yeah, something that um, a, a few players who I talk to regularly uh, have, have told me that it's been in the works since December. Um, don't think it's it's much of a surprise to anybody, even even at the league. Uh, they, they saw this eventually coming. I mean, what, what league in the world doesn't have a players union? Uh, obviously, in North America, including Major League Soccer, there are robust players unions but I'm, I'm in I'm in two minds here because of course I have partners at the league that uh, I speak with and of course I understand uh, the players uh, side of things maybe some of their grievances what they want what they don't want um, I guess where I would start with this is you know for the players I would say tread lightly I would say um, temper expectations in terms of what you ask for, given this is a very young league and, um, you know, ownership groups have invested uh, uh, millions into this, uh, into this, to this league already. But at the same time, you know, you know, fight for what you want and what you think you deserve. But at the same time, just know what's out there to, you know, collect in terms of a collective bargaining agreement from the league. Um, league standpoint, I, I, I think they obviously saw this coming and they would just uh, be wary of what the players would ask for, just given the state of things right now and trying to get things up and running and, and to create a strong league uh, from a financial sense. Um, from where I'm sitting, um, you know, I think the players need the league just as much as the league needs the players. So it's going to be interesting to see how things come together. Hopefully uh, everybody uh, keeps a, a level head and, um, we see where we're at. Um, I did talk to one player and I just said, um, you know, overall, what's, what's the message that the players want to send right now? And that player just told me that we want a voice at the table and we don't want things to happen without, um, you know, us being, uh, having representation, uh, at that table. So that's where I'm at with that. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing things from both sides and, uh, it's a long process. So we'll see where we are in a few years. Ollie, anything to add before we move on? Not too much. Um, you know, we're still kind of gathering information like everyone else and, and figuring out, you know, what the next steps are here. Um, I, I think that's a fair perspective, you know, that example player that Kurt just gave for, for the players to have. And, you know, we do have in this league in particular, maybe compared to Europe, we have a lot of college educated players who have a certain awareness around this, this type of issue. Right. Um, and you would imagine that the current situation and the insecurity that everyone is is feeling um, as a result of this is, is probably accelerated things a little bit. So, you know, I, I understand the player's perspective there and, and we'll see what happens next. Yeah, we're going to get, we're going to get the paw here in a second, but what I would say is I'd add one more thing. And, and just from an owner's standpoint, um, you know, a lot of these players, you know, might not have had somewhere to go if it wasn't for these ownerships putting up their, their, their money and believing in Canadian soccer. So that's where I'll end it for now. 
we'll do more discussion in detail once there's more to talk about and once we in, in the weeks to come but for I guess any sort of up-to-date information, if you are curious about learning more, there, there is a website, it's pfacan.ca. So any questions you may have will be answered there. Otherwise, we'll revisit it when we know more. Okay, on to All the right. fun stuff with Bob. Very excited to have him on. As we mentioned earlier, we're, we will talk Pacific, but we don't think we've had the chance to speak to someone from Norway before. <laughs> so in the sake of having fun, a little Scandinavian segment, we have asked Kurt and Ollie to come up with their top five players from Norway of all time. Pa is going to be the ultimate judge of who has the better list at the end. So Kurt and Ollie both will sell you on who they think are the top five. And coach, if you are, if you don't hear a name or you want to jump in at any point and tell them why they're incredibly wrong and need to do more Norwegian research, please be our guest. And but we will start with Ollie. With your well, time. and before we get going, Ollie, I'm going to let you speak here. But Pa, I would like to remind you that I also have Norwegian ancestry, as you can see by my my, by my last name, Larson. So I'm hoping I don't that know, we can because, because Larsen might may be more of a Swedish because we have the E at the end. I know. <laughs> that's I, true. That's true. That, funny, funny you say that. I was told that my family actually changed it when they came to the United States because they thought it was more American to have an O. Ah, so there you go. Kurt anyway, was prepared for the, for I just the I, I, I look like at this. that. Look at that. Okay, okay. I, I, <laughs> I just want to put that. I wanted to put that in your mind before we get going here. All right, Oliver, ah, go ahead. So, ah, so, ah, so you're buying a vote, huh? You're buying a vote. That's a good way of buying a vote. That's it. All, right. All right, Ollie, sell us on your list. Am I going five to one here? Yes, yeah. you are. Okay. Uh, so number five, I've got the rising star, the guy who could be at the top of this list uh, before very long, uh, and maybe could be Norway's answer to, to Zlatan with his character and the way he plays, Erling Haaland. Uh, number four, I'll admit, I didn't know a lot about this guy, but he was named Norway's best player of the past 50 years. So that is Rune Bratset. He was a captain in, in 1994 when Norway made the World Cup for the first time since 1938. I'm almost re reading up Wikipedia. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Go easy on it. At least, at least we've been to three World Cups, yeah? You've we've been, been to... to oh. We've been to two, all right? I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, they did. They did qualify for 98 after that. So yeah, it has been better lately. Um, I'm scared. I'm scared to get my list now. Huh? All right. Yeah, I've not done my homework. Um, number three, I have Ada Hegerberg, the Ballon d'Or winner in in 2018, one of the best female players in the world, uh, well, and well, arguably certainly, arguably the most. He's the best. The best. All right, I'll I'll, I'll take Pa's word for it. <laughs> after Mada, after Mada, and for me, Tobin Heath. And yeah, Rapino, yeah, Sam Kerr, I'd have up there too, but yeah, she's up there for sure. Okay, um, I'm, I'm crossing people out, I'm crossing people out right now and adding them like quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, yeah. uh, he played for Monaco, played for Roma, but we know him as a Liverpool player at best, obviously. John Arnarisa, um, mm -hmm. an incredible left foot. Number one, for me, it had to be the one of the most popular Man Manchester United players of all time, he scored. Arguably the most famous goal in United's history, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Okay, are we going to let Pa uh, chime in on that, or am I just going to go ahead? Well, do you, you need more what? time to change your list? No, no, yeah, no. exactly. No, no, no. Come on, <laughs> let me. Hear. Okay, okay. So, and all right. So, I, I, I'm going to start at five here. I'm I'm going with John Carew, uh, just just because of the the level he played at. Uh, a bunch of big clubs appeared 91 times for Norway. Uh, I didn't think he'd be on Oliver's list, so I put him on mine. Uh, number four, uh, this is a player who actually got me into Norwegian football, and, I, and part of the reason why I started using Norway when I was playing FIFA, uh, Tor Andre Flo. Uh, 98 World Cup, believe he scored a Ronaldo. famous goal, <laughs> right? That's why they gave him the name Flonaldo. Uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, number three, the best young player in the world, Erling Holland. Uh, and I actually reversed these, Pa. I actually went with Solskjaer as number two and uh, uh, Risa as number one, just because he appeared more times for, for Norway and appeared to contribute at the international level a little bit more. Wow. That's where I'm at. I mean, That's where I'm at. I mean, uh, I, I got the possibility to play with Risa on the 21 level at the national team level as well. Got to play with uh, Kiru the same and Solskjaer we get to play at the, at the national team. 
uh, Holland, I haven't had the possibility, but I've watched him. And uh, Eda, all we know, is one of the best female players in the world. But there's some couple of players missing where I would say, you know what? Hmm. And the research could have been better to say that. <laughs> to say, to say <laughs> What you mean? I gotta spend more than I gotta spend more than twenty minutes doing this. Yeah, come on, man. You have a Norwegian ancestry. Come on, I was expecting more from you. Kurt. I know. Okay. Well, who? All right. Well, who? Uh, all right. Well, nah. give us the few. Give us a few names we missed. I mean, I we obviously uh, Shulshar gotta be in there because because yeah. uh, what he meant for Norwegian football and at the time that. Norway, Norwegian football was on the rise, especially in England with the physicality that was required and Norway had a lot of that. And, and, and they came in and he did pretty well from a small team as Molde, you know. So Solskjaer is definitely in the top five, but uh, I wouldn't put Holland in there yet. Too because, early? No, nah, it's too early because, um, okay, he's on the rise, but on... He's not even playing in the first team, national team. I know it's all about potential with him. It's so, uh, it's so, yeah. so so for him, his potential is huge, and and he's making the right steps uh, for his career right now. But for me, he's not even in the top five yet because if we put him before Erdegaard, who who is also a, a minus talent, he got pretty much talent. Uh, yeah, Erdegaard. that's true. But you have uh, Eric Miklan. I think is one of the greatest midfielders and one of the greatest footballers Norway ever produced. He, the career he had because he was different, like he was so technical, gifted, young mid, uh, like the little. He was an Iniesta type player playing playing for the national team and uh, lived the bohemian lifestyle, to say the least. <laughs> but so gifted. And yeah, Irina Bradset was uh, was the captain of the national team, played for Werder Bremen, played in the German Bundesliga, uh, a, a very big figure in the national team, to say the least. Keru definitely needs to be in there. I agree. Thank you. Be there. Thank yeah, you. He's, 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 like, he's one of the best strikers Norway ever had, to be honest. And for the, like you say, for the amount of uh, uh, clubs that he played for, Champions League final, you know, 2001 lost it played for big clubs and gotten more and should have for me should have gotten more than what he got out to be honest you know but yeah a tremendous player and uh, I would put I would put uh, Lash Bohinen in there Lash Bohinen we're learning so much about Norwegian football today. I love it. Okay, Lars, coach, you... Lars Boinen, who played in England as well. And for me, it's more, I, I like technical players. Mm -hmm. I, I really yeah. do like technical players. And I think because Norway is not actually known for having technical players because yeah. we're all hard workers. We are, you know, it's a country. Right. And, and at the time that they actually qualified, it was at that time we no way played a football that nobody expected. It was physical, it was a lot of long ball, it was structure, it was defensive, but those players with a little bit of flair, you could see who actually could play football. Right, yeah. where, where the quality lied. Where okay, we're, we're, we'll talk some more Norway in a bit. We're, we're going to come back to, we want to get to let, PFC, let but you have to pick winner. your winner, coach. That's yeah, what I'm getting you. to. You got to pick your winner. So, it's a tough one. I think it's a tie. Bye. Oh, <laughs> coach, don't be wishy-washy out with no, us. No, man, I'll give it a tie because, to be honest, I'll give it a tie. But because uh, because uh, Oliver put uh, Edda in there, that kind of that kind of gave him the nut. So I will go. There we go. She she was on my list just for She's what it's worth. In. Okay, more more Norway coming up a little bit later in the show. But let's talk Pacific. We're probably gathering quite a few Trident fans who are excited to hear from you, uh, especially right now to hear anything from the club and it's people is very important to them so if you could just take us back to the time where these conversations started to develop and just give us a little bit of a timeline that led you to becoming the second coach in pacific fc's history i mean um, i mean uh, for me i've had the pleasure of knowing rob for a long time played against him when he came to norway played against him in holland played against him here in mls so so we kind of have a history and, and as well as uh, history with J uh, James Merriman, because we both worked at Whitecaps and uh, right. 
and I was with the first team and he was with the under 15. So when I actually stopped playing, I went down to the to the academy just to just to learn more about academy because I was used to first team. So first team was nothing different. To, was not new to me, but it was good, you know, to go down and be with the with the academy players and see how they're doing it down there, you know, and learn your ropes as a coach for me. That's, that's, that's very important. And, uh, and Jim James and I were in talk uh, for a long time and he told me, Oh, they might, they might be a team in Pacific um, coming to the Island. What's your thought mm -hmm. about it? And I'm like, Oh, that, that would be great. You know, if, if CPL going to have their own league, that's fantastic because they need, they need to have a league and, uh, Rob and I, since we know each other, we texted, but we never actually talked about uh, me being the head coach. You know, that just that that propelled the, at the last month last year. To be honest, it was it was only talks like, where do you see yourself? Because because uh, I was because I just finished up with FC Cincinnati, so I was like, yeah, what do we do now? Do we, with my wife? Do we go back to Europe? Do we want to stay here? We want to stay here because the kids are grown, uh, born in Canada and. Yeah, let's just wait and see and see what will happen in the market because you never know in football everything moves so quick so so to start with that it was just an easy process asking me what my thought process was what i wanted to do what i'm looking for you know and uh, eventually we, we got together and then they asked me and my vision my philosophy and uh, which aligned with the club of the way of thinking of giving youth players possibility you know the chances to play because we were all given the chance to play as a young as a youngster so i do believe that the future lies within the youngster but they're going to need structure they're going to need a coach who also understand it. the north american uh, way especially canada and i was yeah. and yeah and i spent three years with the white caps finished my career here so i think it was a it was a great match so from that you know how it is the bubble start going you start talking and you start getting the sense of okay this might be something that we that the that the all three of us like the idea so and we just went with it yeah kurt, kurt it's safe to say that pacific was one of the more volatile teams last year and what i mean by that is they could be world beaters one day and look like they're never going to lose a game for the rest of the season and then they would just lay an egg and go and you would just kind of shake your head and go what on earth was that all about so what um what is your impression of this year's roster and can we expect to see maybe a little bit more um stability with them yeah i think anybody who who watched pacific last year and, and i think based on the moves that the the, the front office is, is made uh, at pacific and we get pa's opinion on this i think they were aware of some of the issues you know maybe at the back last year and, and, and they brought in a few players to address that um my biggest concern with pacific and, and it's funny because i actually think one of Pacific's strengths last year was also one of its biggest weaknesses. And that is a lot of young players, a lot of promising young players getting a lot of minutes, Pa, mm -hmm. but also uh, not producing wins. So it's balancing that strength, right? And then not turning it into a weakness. So, um, you know, what stepping into this role, what, what are this club's strengths and strengths right now? No, I mean, you're right, because I, it, it was an expansion and team, you know? And the expansion team, you need time. I went through it with FC Cincinnati, where you also have good players, but uh, they need to gel. They need to understand, and the coach need to have a strong philosophy and a believe in what he wants to play, because that's where it starts, and the players buy in. So for me, watching last year, you see a lot of things that was happening, but I was not there to look inside the kitchen and point fingers and say this and this went wrong. But what I can speak about is I've had the... I've known these young players that were here already in Pacific through my experience with them in uh, like with some of them in the Whitecaps, with some of them I played with, you know, so like with the likes of Marcel uh, De Jong, I played with Boldy, Boldy Salvadissimo, Noah Verhoeven. So all these young players, I've had experience with them and they have experience with me. So it's not, it's not, it's not somebody who's not, who doesn't know them, you know? Yeah. And, and I know their strengths and their weaknesses. And like Kurt say, last year, because they were young, but for me, they had one year under their belt. Now they gain experience, but they come in to me and I'm, and I'm taking them to another level, which I do believe that they have the capacity to, and which is bringing structure and bringing uh, 
confidence in them and give them give them the freedom to play in their position and also be good at it. But it's going to be difficult, obviously, because it's a new league and, you know, hopefully we were looking forward to it. But for now, we can. But if the, if the league was him, I think, I think people will see a different Pacific than they did last year. So yeah. I have no, I have no doubt about it. And again, me, I, I don't care about age because for for the young players, they need that experience. They have, they has to be exposed to that experience, you know, of going, playing like you guys say, like a world beater today and the next game, you know. So it's about finding the balance and finding the consistency with them. And we lost a last piece, I think the club did in Marcel Deon, who for us. He was is the captain and one of the best players in the Canadian league, and for us to add the players like Bustos, Marco Bustos, and Jamal Dixon to the squad, that also means a lot. So, so. Ollie, where did you where did you have Pacific in your preseason rankings before the league went on hiatus? Uh, I think I had them fourth, and I, my thought process with that was, you, I think you have to give Forge and Cavalry the credit that. You know, they they were a long way ahead last season and they're going to be up there again in all likelihood. And then there's kind of a mix of teams, including Pacific, who are obviously trying to chase them and trying to bridge that gap. And, you know, you have Edmonton, York, Halifax as well. Um, those teams have, have maybe kind of finished their roster. Pa, you've still got, I think, seven spaces on, on your roster to work with. What? How do you kind of see yourself uh, filling out the rest of the roster and, and what would you like to add to the, to the group you've got already? Well, like I say, for us... Um... The quality we have, and and always in the team, you're looking for people that have similar or better qualities, mm -hmm. because you, you want to drive up the competition. You know, you want players to fight for position. I don't want any of my players to feel like oh they have they have a set place, because I need a squad. And to play a whole season, it's not the first eleven that win you. It's always the squad that's going to win you because injury is going to happen, suspension is going to happen, out of form is going to happen. So you need players that are, that are at a good level so that they can come in and compete. So for us, and we are not going to rush just to make a signing. That signing has to fit into to our style of play and he has to be a character that of a good person first because that's what I value first. You know, you can have the best talent, but if you are a bad teammate, it doesn't help nobody. You know, you're going to be cancer. So for me, I need I need somebody who is a good person and who's buy-in to our philosophy and our way of playing in, like in Pacific. And once you have that, then his quality will shine. And also, we're not afraid to give young players again chance. For me, this is a league where it's a great league for young players to come and develop, especially young Canadian players, because there's good enough players, young Canadian players, but they have to be given a chance. So for me, I'm not afraid to give any young player a chance or find a player who I know will be the right balance and fit into what we're doing here. Yeah. Which we uh, had Marco I, Bustos on the show. Sorry, Bella, do you want to jump in? No, I was just going to say, I, I totally agree with you on the depth, but you also must be pretty excited about what your best starting 11 could look like with, with Bustos and De Jong, as you mentioned, and Dixon and Mayer Jaguar coming in. It's, it's, you know, of that that kind of chasing pack that I mentioned, I think you guys might have the strongest best eleven, if, if that makes sense. Well, you know, honestly, you know, like it's very difficult. We all know that in football, yeah. Sometimes you need that luck, and 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 like you guys say, we have to give credit to to Forge and uh, Calgary because they are the reason why they were the best team last year. And yeah. to that, it's they had a very good, they had a strong roster, they had experience in the roster. They had the young upcoming players. They had the X factors like uh, Tristan Borches, and we also do have those players now. And we had uh, Terran Campbell last year when nothing was expected from, and he produced. You know, Caden uh, had a decent season. You know, and I do believe that he has the capacity to be one of the best right backs in this league. So there's we have we have a good balance. Yeah, and I'm very excited with the players like Alessandro Diaz, who we have, who's played in one of the best teams in in America, which is Club America, and and to play there, play Champions League, so he have that experience and still a humble guy coming in and working working every day, you know. So we have we have so far a strong roster, but obviously as a team, you will always look at to add pieces that can 
and drive up the competition. But we are not just going to make a move just to make the move for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one of the moves you did make was bringing in Marco Bustos. And we had him on the show the end of March. And he, he was speaking about your relationship. He, he almost spoke about you as if he was a big, you were a big brother figure to him. So what can you tell us about Marco and your relationship? And, and what do you envision his role to be on this team? Nah, it is, it is, we all know that his quality is eminent. We all know that. Right? And for me, it's, it's, I saw it day one since I saw him in the white caps and being with the first team. But I think sometimes for young players, they, they, they have to go through some growing pains to understand what it really takes. And at that time, to be honest, and he would tell you himself, he lived of his uh, talent. Mm. You no, know, he, he didn't understand what it really was to be a professional, but that was not knock on him. For me, it's the surroundings, it's the structure that you give to a young player for him to succeed. And at that moment for me, I was, I was coming at the end of my career. So, so like, I'm, so I'm watching and I'm like, wow, this guy got talent. But for me, he didn't do enough of it because he didn't realize what it actually meant to be professional. That is just not show up to training, train, and that's it. And you're done with it, you know? And then, ah, the rest of the day I can do like this. So I was constantly on him. I'm like, dude, there's a lot of other things like your nutrition, you know, taking care of your body, you know, being focused in training, you know? And at that time when, 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 when you're the best in the youth and nobody says nothing to you, like, other things for you to handle adversity was totally different for them because they never faced it. Right. You know, so for me and him, it was constantly, I was constantly on him and I never gave him that feeling that I'm satisfied, you know, and he would tell you I was very hard on him because we had a bet <laughs> and, and it wasn't quite a bet because after the, after the season 2015, I told him when 2016 come, I'm going to be fitter than you, right? That's a bet, right? I, I said, if you come in fitter than me, I owe you 200 bucks. So you uh-huh. better make sure that you come in. But for me, it was just a more of a mental test to see whether yeah. he actually go through it. And, and he, he totally changed because I, because I use the word that I'm not going to say, but I use the <laughs> word which really hit him home. Right. It, really, it really clicked for him then when he said, when he came back, he said that clicked to him because nobody ever said that to him. And yeah. from that moment, he's, 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 he changed his lifestyle totally. And, and that's credit to him. And one thing, yeah, wh- one thing I like about Marco Bustos, Pa, is that he believes in himself now, that's for sure, because he came on our show a few weeks ago. Oh, he always, and, always, he always had that belief. Trust me, he always okay. had the belief. I had to just knock it down of him. Well, <laughs> Well, I have also spent some time knocking the belief down just a little bit because he called me out for not putting him in the best 11 last year. I oh, defended you, you myself. Have. Well, I defended <laughs> myself. You know, I, As of right now, he's not even in my best three. I would say I have Dominic Zator, Kyle Becker, Daniel Krutz, and all these guys ahead of him. But you tell me, is Marco Bustos one of the best players? Is he yeah. the best player in the CPL? I have no doubt that he has the quality to be the best. And I tell him that he has to be the best. That's just simply it is. He has to be the best. So that's that's a pressure he put himself, but also that's a pressure that I put on him, which I do believe he has. Because for me, he has that quality. And that was and that was evident. And I think uh, and I think if this league was going and where he is mentally and physically, he was ready to go. And he's still ready to go because every single day he's like he's his mind is always running. And like I say now, he's for me a totally boosters, a different boosters that I've known now than to 2015. And again, that's credit to him putting in the work because you have to put in the work. And he understood that he needs to put in the work. So I think people that doubt him, Kurt, you better watch out because <laughs> because when we resume the season, he's coming with fire. He I also. I'm also, you'll find I'm one of the first people to raise my hand and say I was wrong. So I'll be, I'll be right here watching. So let's go. No, no, he's not. Definitely. I'm everybody. He's, he's looking forward to do this, like to the season, like anybody else when that, when that happens. So. And we're, we're seeing Marco put in the work literally every single day with those Instagram workout videos. So the, the guy seems to be spending his quarantine productively. 
Oh yeah, he does. No, he is not. Everybody, to be honest, our whole team, to be fair, it's it's been like it's been great. And for me, as one as the leader, it's been great just to see how how all these players have bought in and how they believe in it and they're working. You know, like it's not easy. Like we all know, in yeah. this situation, we all would love to do something. But on the other hand, I, I also tell them, let's be, let's be, let's be grateful. You yeah. know, let's be grateful for this time that we have right now because. Even though what we love has been taken away from us, there's other things in life that we also can focus on, like family. Couldn't agree more. Lost, yeah. you know, lost times with other people, but also do other things. Find things about yourself that you normally would not have done if the season was on, you know? So, yeah, it's 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 ex extreme time, and you're right. Yeah. There's a lot of things right now we can all be doing just to sort of find that in ourselves. Gonna get to, to a question from the chat. This one comes from B Colt, and he wants to know: Is there a desire to raid the Whitecaps Academy by offering players minutes Vancouver can't? And raid is a direct quote from yeah, the chat. Yeah, no, nah, for me, it's not about raid. And again, like I say, the players are smart enough. Mm -hmm. If players are seeing what we're doing, and they kind of feel like, oh. I, I, will, I will get my chance there. You know, players are welcome to come to us, but to say it's a raid is not a raid. Players have to figure out what is the best solution for them for their football career. We're here on the island trying to do our way, what we believe is the right way to produce players and help players get along with their career. You know, right. so I was given a chance at 16 years old, so I do know how it feels to give young players a chance and have a coach that truly believe in you that you're going to be successful. Not somebody who just believe in you, just, ah, right now you're the hot topic. And then after a couple of months, you were, no, a talent needs to be nurtured and it needs to be nurtured with structure. It needs to be nurtured just like you have your own kid for me, you know? So for me, when I look at these players, I look at them like a family. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to go through rough times. They're going to need me, you know? I'm going to need them. So it's all about finding the right balance. So I will not raid. Raid is not a use. We're getting calls if from the White Castle. If there's a good talent and the talent see the possibility to come to, to come to Pacific, who are we to say no? Yeah. yeah. No? Well, there's your answer, B. Colt. So we're not going to raid, but the door is open if they think it's in their best interest. Door is okay. open. Doors always open with Coach Pamaduka. Let's talk about our, or let's get on to our next roundtable discussion today. And this is going to be very interesting because aside from myself, everyone else in the chat today is not born in Canada. So the kid Canada here, but everyone else has come from afar, but now make Canada their home. So I want to explore those different areas with everyone. But Kurt, I'll start with you. What are some of the, the differences that stand up to you from the people in Canada versus your uh, your hometown friends from uh, rural Kansas? Uh, rural Kansas, 30 minutes outside <laughs> Kansas City. I know. Uh... <laughs> so shout, shout out to Olathe, Kansas. Look it up, O-L-A-T-H-E. Um, I don't, don't want my 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 fellow Kansans to take this the wrong way, but I just find that back home people are just a little bit more reckless in everything they do, if you will. Uh, yeah, just I'll give an example um, of you know when I came to Toronto, uh, there was some severe weather, and a lot of my buddies were, oh, did you hear there was a small tornado up in? up in Vaughan and uh, here uh, or back in Kansas, when, whenever we hear the tornado sirens go off, we, we typically open our garage doors and set up some lawn chairs and kind of take in, take in the storm. <laughs> so I just find everything we did in Kansas is just, you're just a little bit more reckless, a little bit more reckless in nature, which might not surprise uh, many of our Canadian viewers. <laughs> Ollie, what about you and Milton Keynes? Um, well, I, I don't want to, buy into the stereotype too much but i do find canadians to be friendlier than than english people are um really yeah a, shock, a no? lot a lot friendly <laughs> a lot friendlier i don't buy it uh, what well, no, like, i don't think so no <laughs> <laughs> i, I no, think i think I, honestly I, I think i think people in kansas are much more friendly than people in toronto so but well, that's just me. I'm, I'm not going to steal your thunder here. What do you, you, you do you? Well, to, to give you an example, like my girlfriend is Canadian and we've been back a couple of times. And I think it's fairly typical in Canada that if you go into, say, a small store, you greet the store owner, you say hello, maybe have a little bit of conversation. Yeah. Um, when, when she tried that in, in my hometown of, of Milton Keynes, she did not get such a warm reception from the, uh, 
the, the store and as he looked kind of suspicious of her so uh <laughs> she, she found that a little bit of a um a culture shock and and yeah I, I do think that people are generally just a bit more open and friendly in Canada Coach, same question for you. Now, I'm curious your answer. I won't go off on too much of a tangent, but I will say that I'm reading a book right now called Exile Air, and it talks about uh, a camp in Muskoka, which is where the little Norway had their Air Force training here during the war. And the, the book talks about the relationship between Norway and Canada. And, and so there's the similarities that the, the people found from the Norwegian Armed Forces. So I'm wondering if you found some similarities or maybe I'm completely off base here. No, Canadians are just like Norwegians. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. It's just that we try to make these differences. Conservative, conservative people don't want no controversies, no nothing. Just take it easy. Neutral people, you know, <laughs> keep it to themselves. Everybody is serious. It's for me, it's like it's the same, but also the country on everything with health care, everything. The people are just almost the same. You know. And you're in one of the more beautiful places in the country right now on Vancouver Island. What about the geography? There's, does it seem a little bit similar? I mean, perhaps not so much in British Columbia than, say, some of the northern parts of Canada. But what about the, those differences and similarities? Man, it's expensive like Norway. <laughs> <laughs> it's like expensive like Norway. Unbelievable. No, nah, but yeah, with the nature, is unbelievable. For me, mm -hmm. like my wife, my wife, uh, my wife, uh, I think... For the past two years that we lived in uh, the mainland, she always wants to take me out. But for me, I'm like, babe, there's no need for me. I just see Canada as Norway. It's like the nature and everything. Where, where do I need to go? <laughs> like, do I need to go to the forest? I've been to the forest all my life in Norway. I don't need to see no more forest. I'm tired. I just want to stay home. But yeah, but uh, now that we're on the island and with two kids, I have no choice. But the nature is beautiful. It's like the nature and the people, it's especially here on the island, they're so welcoming, you know, they're open, so they've taken us in. So it's been great. Yeah. So much to do on the South Island. Kurt, aside from tornadoes in Kansas, <laughs> yeah. what are some of the things that stand out for you? No, well, I'm still on the weather thing because I just find that uh, people here in Toronto, at least, they, they, they always feel like they're hard done by, by the weather. And I don't find the weather here to be bad or extreme in, in really any way. And in Kansas, for instance, you get... You get, the tornado, you get the tornadoes, the terrible weather, but you also get 100 degree heat in the summer. Uh, and uh, it also snows and ices quite a bit in, in Kansas, too. So the weather there is actually way worse. And people in Toronto are always kind of surprised when I say that. They don't believe it, but it's true. No, I agree on that. It's not nice to play in the Kansas heat. That's for sure. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, though, because obviously you've been down there, right? So you've, you've experienced it. No, it's not, it's not nice. Like the Kansas heat... I think it's only three places in the U.S. I played, and I'm like, wow. It was Philly in the summer. It was very humid. Kansas and Houston. And I was like, no chance. Like, <laughs> no, serious. It was just like going back to the Middle East and playing in the Middle East. And I'm you know like, what, oh. though? It's, what, it's a little bit why I miss it, though, because you kind of miss those extremes <laughs> when you're – you do a little bit. You miss those extremes of, of pretty much everything, right? You like those four – I like those four distinct seasons anyway. Mm. Is the rain stereotypes true? Is that something you're noticing? The rain stereotype for Canada? For England. Oh, yeah. It's well, rainy, no, yeah. rainy all the time and you get more yeah, sun it's, here. It's much rainier in England, obviously. And here it just tends to snow, which I prefer. Um, a lot more scenic here, I'd say, as well. Like, just in kind of going north of Toronto, it's beautiful up there. I love going up there. And we don't have a ton of that in England. So, once again, right. Canada beats England. <laughs> So we've, we've learned today that Norway is the same as Canada. People misunderstand Kansas and England once again falls behind Canada. Yeah, I'm, I'm not doing the best pitch for England here. But <laughs> tourism that's, that's tourism Milton Keynes is not going to be overly thrilled with you. <laughs> no. yeah. uh, let's, uh, let's get some more questions. Well, we, we think we've wrapped up sort of the, the geography game, but um, mm. Kurt, I know, I know you had a question for, for coach and he, he alluded to uh, his time in Saudi Arabia. So I'll let you have the first question here. No, I just, just, Pop, just if you could reflect a little bit on some of the, the places you've played. Uh, I'm thinking in, in Qatar, I, I think you spent a little bit of time in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then even in Portland. I mean, look, I've been to Portland. It's, it's, it's a different place, right? It's a different, it's a different animal, right? So can you just reflect on, on, on those kind of points in your career a little bit and, and maybe some fun stories? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I got, I, got the, I got the opportunity to go to Qatar, which was... 
I'll be, like, I'll be honest, it was for the money. <laughs> There's nothing else you go to there today. It's just the reality. You know, yeah. I was playing all my life in uh, Europe and, and I've always been somebody that always like adventure. So when that so when that came in, I remember I was in I was in Barcelona with my with my wife then. And we were kind of walking and then and I just got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. And the guy just go, Yeah, would you like to come and play in Qatar? And prior to that, I had a friend that actually went. So he, he was like, and I was like, well, it just depends. It's like, yeah, what you guys have to offer. He's like, yeah, we can offer this and this. So at that time, and I'm like, hmm, that's not a bad wage, you know, but I'm like, no, I would like this and this. So he just said, okay, give me five minutes. Hang up, went back in, called back. He said, okay, we have this. And I look at my wife and I'm like, okay, what do we do then now? <laughs> you no. Know? So then, so then we went, we went there, took my wife and, um, and we were sitting on the table discussing about finalizing the contract and the owner just turned around and just go to my wife. What did you study? My wife said, I study international business. Oh, would you like, oh, would you like to have a job? <laughs> <laughs> like straight up and, and we're sitting there and she's looking at me. I'm like, yeah, go for it. I don't mind. No, so, but. Honestly, like it's there's a misconception because um, because it's a small nation and they're one of the wealthiest nation in the world, mm. obviously. And uh, but uh, very friendly people, very very friendly people. And until to this day, we still have contacts with a lot of people down there, and we talk. And there's also some things that they need to change, obviously. But honestly, for people when you're there, you you kind of lose a little touch of reality yeah. everything is done for you you basically don't need to do nothing and there were times that we come back to europe and i need to fill gas and i'm just sitting in the car <laughs> and, and then my wife will look at me and go you know the car is not going to fill itself <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of come back but qatar was qatar was ahead in terms of uh, futuristic stuff and doing all this stuff they're a very ambitious country saudi to me was uh, was was too little and I open it. Was too little and I open it because uh, the country is huge, and there's a, such a big difference between the rich and the poor. You know, there was a, right. there was like homeless people like you will see in some states like Seattle, like Portland. It was a huge huge there, and that's not something you expected. And me being a Muslim, I got the possibility to go to Mecca, which is uh, the holy place, and Yep. It was it was also a little bit of a shock because you have this idea of how Makkah is and inside the inside the holy place was nice and everything was great, but then you just go one street further, it's like you're in the ghetto. So, so it was kind of you go, wow, you go like this. But when you're inside the country, it's less strict than what they show. You know, right. so, so so people people are free in there. You know, and even people, and I've saw, I've seen some stuff. I mean, I go, wow, trust me, stuff that you, you, you go like, hmm. it was like price, that. Heads price off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Problem. You know, so, 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 so there was those things. But then, when I was in, when I was in uh, Saudi, and uh, because my wife couldn't travel, so I had to be the driver. So, so I learned Arabic, and we were, <laughs> we were at the shopping mall to buy food. And they were speaking Arabic, and we not we without not understanding that I understand everything they're saying because it was unusual for for a black man to, you know, to to know the common with, tongue, to go shopping with your with your wife who is white. Yeah. So when you arrive at the at the counter, and and then and then the guy is saying, yeah, he must be the driver, or he must be the servant, and stuff like that. You know, and me, I'm laughing because I know exactly what they're saying. So I'm not saying. Yeah. Anything because my wife is in front of me and then she goes and I'm about to pay. And then, and then he goes, how the heck is he? Why is he paying? Who is he? What does he do? <laughs> it's like, this. So I'm just laughing and I don't say anything. So we walk off and I tell my wife and I'm like, they thought I was your servant, you know? So just, just like this, because the picture of a, a black man and a white man in a shopping mall, you know, and the black man paying is like, hmm, that doesn't add up, you know? That doesn't add yeah, no, up. No doubt some cultural differences, to, to say the least. Oh, buddy, Ollie, what's, was, what's on your mind for the coach? 
Um, well, my question is going back to Pacific, actually. Um, we talked a little bit about it already, about kind of the relationship you have with guys like Bustos and, and some of the guys who are with the Whitecaps. Now you're the head coach, you're the boss in charge. Does that change at all, that relationship? Do you have to be the bad cop more often or does it stay the same? No, but like I said, for me, nothing changes because the guys knows who I am and I know who they are, but also I know who I am as a person, as a coach. And for me, I think that's the most important thing that you know how to balance being a coach and being and being their friend. Because by yeah. the end of the day, for me, it's all about respect. And for me, like the way you, the way I treat my players is the way I want to be treated. So I'm not going to just change because I have a title. You know, we know a lot of people will change because there's a title put, put like put onto you. I, mean, I, I don't care about the title. For me, it's about the human being, the person that I'm dealing with every single day. Because they know me and they know that I'm not afraid to make a decision or, or, or anything. But also for me, it's about the respect, having that respect among each other. Mm -hmm. Back to the chat for a second. A quick one from Adam who wants to know what your favorite away trip was in Major League Soccer. My favorite away trip. My favorite away trip and I, like, I, I really enjoyed playing against Galaxy. Those, those beautiful stadium galaxy and seattle were, were and and vancouver to be honest were, were my three favorite trips to go because once i never lost to the galaxy so that was a good thing <laughs> so i was always happy to go down and play there and uh also the atmosphere in seattle when it was portland against seattle was just amazing you know it's just like being in a european stadium again and that gave you that vibe and playing against vancouver because it's a cascade rival so yeah so that was I noticed good. you picked, yeah, you stayed on the West Coast, though. You didn't like those long East Coast flights? Oh, buddy, five hours in the <laughs> five hours kills you, man. But it's so crazy because it's just like, for me, it was the first time I was like, no, nah. you know, coming in. That's that's when you real, that's when you really realize that this country, that America is a huge country. Yeah. It's like five hours well, time differences and you're like, oh, man. I don't know. Did you ever have to do that Vancouver to Orlando trip? Because that... No, no, no. I was lucky because my, because my daughter was just born, and then oh, okay. yeah. and then Robo, and then and then Carl Robinson at the time he said, you know what, you're not going on this long trip, and I'm like, thank you, because they because they end up being <laughs> serious. It's the first time ever in my football career that I was happy not to travel. <laughs> first time I'm, now. I'm good with that. Are you looking forward to the first Halifax uh, away trip? <laughs> Yeah, I don't need to play, so now, so now I'm forward to it. <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, our friends at MajorLeagueSoccer.com, speaking of Major League Soccer, they've come up with uh, an idea that they've been using to try and pass this quarantine time. And what they've done is come up with their Mount Rushmore of Major League Soccer. So we liked that idea so much, we decided we're going to steal it a little bit, but put our own spin on it. So I'm going to ask our three guests today to come up with their own personal route, Mount Rushmore. And it doesn't have to be from soccer. It doesn't have to be from your country like we were discussing earlier. It is just your all-time athlete, Mount Rushmore. So you get to pick four people and give us a, a quick explanation on why. Uh, I'll, let's, let's give you the first go this time. Are we, going, let's go, are we going one by one? I think we should go one by one. Okay. Okay. Uh, my, my first one is my childhood hero. Had more than one jersey with this guy's name on the back. So it's David Beckham. No surprise there, really. Yeah, yeah. Shocking. Like Canadians, it's like a Canadian <laughs> saying Wayne Gretzky. It's the, yeah, it's the yeah. one you just got to get out of the way. Kurt? I only, have one, I only have one soccer player on my list. Am I going next? Yep. All right, so I'm, I'm going to leave my soccer player till the end. Uh, I'm not even a big NBA fan, uh, but uh, I still have visions of myself in my, my room back in rural Kansas uh, watching Michael Jordan play for the Bulls every single game. So... Uh, I think if you're a, a millennial, especially a older millennial, like if Michael Jordan is not on your list, then you're not a fan of sports. So Michael Jordan's on my Mount Rushmore. Coach, who's your first? I'm going Muhammad Ali. Mm. Our producer, our producer had him on his list, and I was like, you didn't, you didn't even watch him fight, and he's like, ah, I know, but so I is what Ali. it is. You, you can't argue with Muhammad Ali. Okay, Ali, number two. Number two, so. The sport that I'm kind of more of a fan of, like soccer has become part of my job. The, the sport that I just watch purely to be a fan is, is still hockey. Uh, and I'm a Leafs fan. So 
my favorite player growing up with the Leafs was the the Russian winger Alexander McGilney. So he is mm. on my list as well. Oh, wow. There you go. That that would make a lot of Canadians Mount Rushmore, I think. But yeah. Uh, yeah. hey, that's a good pick. Kurt, are you going hockey player next? Uh, and to be honest, I I, don't... <laughs> I didn't think so. That's why I wanted to get that in there. I did watch the New York Rangers of old with Mark Messier when I was back in Kansas City. But uh, to be honest, I don't even know who that guy was that that Oliver just named. So <laughs> that tells you my level of hockey knowledge. Um, so uh, I'm going with an Olympian next, an American Olympian, somebody that uh, we, we crowded around our TVs to watch and watched his golden shoes. I'm going with Michael Johnson as uh, being on my, my Mount Rushmore. Uh, it was a shame what happened to him at the Sky Dome. Little blemish pulled up with a, with a hamstring injury. Uh, but I'm going with uh, Michael Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> against Donovan Bailey <laughs> <laughs> we forget about that one we forget oh, about that one yeah. Americans do, Canadians don't <laughs> coach number two oh. uh, Michael Jordan Michael Jordan, same yes. reason did, did you have a particular affinity with him or a story that really like resonated with you or just the great athlete that he is no, nah, for me just his, his competitive nature he did everything to win and, and it's just, yeah, for me watching him growing up as a kid like Kurt said if you if you're the new millennium and you don't you have to YouTube him but for us at the time you know we're trying to receive VC, uh, VHS uh, cassettes to watch of watch him and right was, okay I'm just gonna make a quick note here never ask uh, the LeBron versus MJ chat okay who's whoa, 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 <laughs> no but I do I, I do you have to wonder if if kids now you know like like Gen Z or whatever it is if they're gonna say LeBron or Kobe whereas you know, someone like me or Pa would say Jordan, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I do have, but I do have LeBron in there. He's in yours too. I use in mine too. Oh, oh wow. so we okay. started off round three with two basketball players, MJ okay. and LeBron. Okay, number three uh, for Mr. Platt. Number three for me um, is probably just a footballer that I'm kind of most fascinated by, um, which mm -hmm. is Diego Maradona. Um, I think. <laughs> I think yeah. Messi, I would, I would say Messi is a better player, but Maradona, just with all the stuff that went on around him. <laughs> no? Yeah. Are you talking to the new millennials? Uh, um, well, I am one, right? So, <laughs> You know, we only have four picks, right? Four picks? Yeah, yeah that's my third. Okay. okay, I know, I'm just saying. I, I was choosing between Messi and Maradona, and I, and I think Maradona is just kind of, all the crazy uh -huh. stuff that went on around him makes him a bit more of a, a legacy figure, so I went with him. He won the World Cup. Messi hasn't won World Cup yet. Yeah, but is that his fault or is it Higuain's fault for? <laughs> I thought I thought the idea here was to like have someone who was influential in your lifetime, but it is it... your Mount Rushmore. The yeah, he, rules he are what you be. want them to be. <laughs> okay. 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 Number three for you, Mr. Larson. Uh, so. Uh... A player who saved Major League Baseball, uh, completely captivated uh, the entire United States. Uh, I'm going with Mark McGuire as being the third, uh, the third face on my Mount, my Mount Rushmore. Very good. Kurt, you missed our McGuire chat yesterday. You weren't on the show. Um, I'm ashamed. You'll have to fill me in later. <laughs> Coach, finish us off, please, and thank you. Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Okay. You put them on as a sports figure? For me, yes. Okay. Tell us why. The reason why I put him up there is um, is what he actually meant a lot to football players. Because people forget that. But for, for me, being born in Africa and seeing what he struggled and how to make it, that also gave me a drive not to never stop even when it became toughest in the game. So honestly, I don't have any, I don't have any footballer as an idol. Never had. And for me, it, it was more about people that stood for something that I actually looked up to, hmm. or saw as a vision of doing something. So here for him, and also growing up and with my dad, who's who, who played the game, but also who was who was busy with things off like off the pitch, doing politics and stuff. That's why when I when I took him as a present for him to go see World Cup in 2010 back in Africa and we visited Robben Island, it was one of the few times I ever saw my dad cry. Wow, that's so, a beautiful story. So, so knowing what Mandela meant to him and to me, that was a, that was a big impact. 
Uh, who wants the tough uh, job to follow up that one? I'll, I'll, follow up. <laughs> I'll follow it up. I actually had one. I also had one uh, non-athlete on my top of my, my prospects list. Uh, not, not, not nearly as influential as Nelson Mandela. I was considering putting Bruce Arena on here. I did not though. Um, and uh, I was racking my brain to, to come up with the soccer player I wanted on my list and went through 94 World Cup squad for the United States. That was a big, a massive influence on me. Went through, you know, in the 98, 2002, and all these men's World Cup teams. And, and I couldn't really differentiate anybody on there. So I went with Mia Hamm, actually, as being on my Mount Rushmore because oh. she was extremely iconic in the 90s and uh, what she meant to, to, to young girls and boys growing up. So I went with Mia Hamm as my fourth, uh, my fourth face on Mount Rushmore. Larson's wow. Mount Rushmore. That's a good one. All right. Well, mine is mine is going to sound fairly ridiculous after those two answers, but here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was told before the show that I'd be mocked if I put any English third division players on the list, so I've gone ahead and, and done just that. Um, <laughs> oh dear. Take that, producer Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> but this one actually turned out to be a bit of a superstar. So he's from my hometown. He's my hometown's most famous son, uh, and that is Delhi Ali. Up top. Cool. There we go. Yeah. Well, Tottenham showed good stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so recap everyone real quick. Your Mount Rushmore's Kurt first. Uh, Michael Jordan, Michael Johnson, Mark McGuire, Mia Hamm, Ollie, uh, Beckham, McGillney, Maradona, and Delhi. That's one of the strangest yet most beautiful <laughs> Mount Rushmores out there, I think. And Coach Pa, <laughs> round us out. And uh, oh yeah, Muhammad Ali, Michael Jordan, and. Uh, the big Nelson Mandela and LeBron. We had two. We had two basketballers on there. Well, I was last. LeBron, LeBron, because what he's done, he's also you have yeah. to give it to him. And I and I think people should not compare him to Joe. You you can't yeah. compare different different generations, but they are still some of the biggest superstars oh, of yeah. their generation. So okay. I, I agree. Got to give credit where credits due. Okay, last question for you before we say goodbye, Coach. Is what is a player, or who is a player? I guess is the correct way of asking this. That you have played with in the past that you would love to just throw on your PFC squad for this season. Say the hardest day. for last. One Come player on, from your past. So uh, the, every player that I've played with. Every player you've played with, a former teammate of yours that you could add for this season in their prime. In their prime. Yeah. Let's make it harder. <laughs> I got I can't let you off easy, coach. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> nah, now you put me on the spot. Now I have to okay. Have to, you'll, you'll have to you'll have to follow up with us on that. You can tweet us. No one comes to mind, not one. So I will follow up with, okay, let's say, let's take players in North America who, who actually okay. I thought they have the possibility to go and play in Europe, who actually, when I came and truly understood, oh, there's a right. Darlington Nagby. Oh, yeah. Okay. Darlington Nagby. I just want to know if he's going to meet his potential. I just want to know if he's going to meet his potential. Yeah. I just want to know where he's going to be and, and, and is he going to meet that potential he has, you know? But with him, that is the thing. That's why I say he's underrated because a lot of people look at him differently than what he really is. But whenever he's not playing, he's actually one of the players that you actually miss in your team. Because he can score goals when he needs to, but Darlington is truly a team player. But I saw him, so, I saw him do some stuff that he can do on a daily basis if he wanted to. If, if the team asked him really to do that, a lot of people would be surprised to what his quality actually is. And that you see, because you, you cannot be a bad player when you go and you can change a franchise like Atlanta. Everybody speak about Martinez, all of the scoring goals. But and if you truly see the game, you see him running the midfield. And he had, truly has this quality. And I've never, I've, when I came to North America and saw him play, and the goal he scored against Dallas in the cup, was unbelievable. Serious. The guy basically just decided just to take the ball and just dribble five players. And after the game, I'm like, come on, we need to get to you to Europe. You have to leave. <laughs> so he's, he's truly underrated. He's truly, truly underrated. 
Yeah. That's a great way to wrap up an hour with Coach Bamadou Ka of Pacific FC. A couple quick housekeeping notes before we say goodbye. The bracket challenge is still alive and well. If we do this again next year, I think Coach Paz got a good chance to be on there. Our matchups right now in the third installation of this, Christine Sinclair and Rianne Wilkinson, Christian Jack against Scott Arfield, Atiba Hutchinson, and Coach Bobby Smirniotis of Forge, and Kenneth Heiner Muller and one of his players stephanie LeBay. you can vote on our instagram and on our twitter at one soccer when you're done doing that make sure you give us a subscribe like the video if you liked it share it with a friend spread the word spread the good times we have here on the player and pundit hangout coach thank you so very much for spending an hour with us it was great to get to know you a little bit better and, and hear some pretty fantastic stories oh thank you thank you for having me guys and hopefully we see each other Let's go. We, sooner than later is what we sooner will than later see. that's what we all hope for that's what we all hope for Pressure's on, Marco. Pressure's on, Bustos. For Kurt and Ollie, I'm Adam Jenkins. Thanks so much. Claire Rustad on One Soccer Happy Hour tonight, and the Hangout will be back tomorrow. Until then, stay happy, stay safe, and stay sane. Thank you.